Uh, we're about to start the last session of the day. Before we dive in, I just wanted to remind everyone that there is a reception on the second floor right below us after the conclusion of this uh, session. So prepare yourself, yourself get excited. Um, and then I want to introduce uh, Dominic Bird McDevitt, who is the Digital Content Specialist at the National Archives. Uh, he's part of the Cataloging API design team um, and has been since its inception. He specializes in linked open data, APIs, crowdsourcing, user experience, and online community management. So please join me in welcoming Dominic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for staying until the end. I was a little intimidated being outnumbered by all the Library of Congress people here. Um, this, uh, if you don't know, maybe might come as a surprise. Um, is the vision statement for the National Archives. We will be known for cutting edge access to extraordinary volumes of government information and unprecedented engagement to bring greater meaning to the American experience. Uh, updated recently in 2014. Um, so, just to uh, introduce myself, um, I came to NAR, the National Archives, in 2011. Um, I was not originally hired as the resident uh, API guy, uh, mainly because there wasn't an API. Um, I was originally hired to manage uh, NARA's Wikipedia program uh, and work on other crowdsourcing programs. Um, so I want to talk today uh, not, uh, just about a specific uh, linked data issue, but also just about uh, like institutional attitudes towards linked data. Uh, open data, um, more generally structured data, uh, and our experience, our uh, journey at the National Archives. Um, so uh, I want to start off with a little bit of catalog humor. <laughs> this is a, an email we received to the main National Archives uh, reference <laughs> inbox last week. Um, so uh, it says, subject line, request a catalog at 123 and uh, please send a catalog to my home. Thank you, Milton. Uh, redacted personal details. Uh, but um, it's not my job to respond to these inquiries, which we get a lot of. Um, but we do have staff. I'm just going to read the first paragraph here. Dear Milton, thank you for contacting the National Archives. The National Archives catalog contains more than 23 million archival descriptions and 80 million digitized pages. Our catalog is only available online. Um, so, yeah, we have a lot of data at the National Archives. Um, over 100 million records uh, in the catalog. Uh, billions of physical and electronic records. Uh, can't give you an exact number because that includes the unprocessed, unique records in the National Archives. Uh, and actually, over a million uh, National Archives records have public contributions tags or trans transcriptions submitted um, via our online catalog. Um, so we have a lot. Um, if you're familiar with the Digital Public Library of America, DPLA, National Archive, the National Archives is the largest contributor um, to DPLA. Um, by far, uh, more than triple the second place is Smithsonian. Um, so, uh, all of this is to say, um, you know, we have uh, an issue of like scale as well. Um, but I want to um, back up and talk about how we got to this point where we have millions of records to begin with for for users. Um, and uh, part of that is because um, you wouldn't have been impressed by our data the amount or the quality um, back in 2011 when I came to the National Archives. Um, and for context, one of my first jobs uh, working uh, was, was to uh, try to upload um, records from our holdings to Wikimedia, Com Wikimedia Commons, so Wikipedia. Um, the, the way we did that was actually uh, we had a leftover storage drive from uh, that from the digital digitization labs, uh, like a physical drive um, that I used 
for the files, and then we were scraping the HTML from the online catalog at the time. Um, <clears throat> and you might want to cover your eyes, but I'm actually going to skip. Uh, this is the catalog I'm talking about. Um, if you can see on the big screen, that's small. That, that's not a persistent URL at the bottom, also. So hopefully this is the only uh, non-persistent URL you see at a link data conference. Um, but this, is, this was our catalog, um, the archival research catalog, ARC, if you're familiar. Um, and uh, th that, that catalog persisted until uh, 2013. So this is kind of a story of um, catalogs. Um, the, this is for, this is also, this is what an individual record looked like. This is a record with a digital image. It's been digitized. This is what the catalog record looks like. Um, so the, the reason I wanted to talk about that is because in um, 2014, the National Archives put out a new strategic plan, um, a four-year plan, um, and established, started establishing some new goals. Um, and this is one part of it that I think is really important. Uh, it says, uh, we'll reach beyond the traditional role of making records available for others to discover, and we'll make access happen by providing flexible tools and accessible resources that promote public participation. Uh, emphasis in the original. So this is what the catalog looks like today. Um, uh, just at a surface level, you can see uh, there's a, a focus. This is the, I should say, uh, in 2014, around the same time as the strategic plan, this is the catalog that was launched. Uh, the focus is on serving the user's needs, uh, spotlighting the images, which is what most people on the web are actually searching for, the things that they can look at and use. Um, so that's a, an example of um, you know, making access happen. Another example was um, part of the, and I don't know if any of you have experienced this, this is the first time for me that a planning document I worked on uh, what became a headline in TechCrunch. Um, <laughs> but one of the things we said in our strategic plan was that the National Archives has a goal of uploading its holdings to Wikimedia Commons. All of, all of, all of the National Archives holdings are going into Wikipedia. Um, remember the 100 million number that I said recently. So uh, that's a, a big um, goal, um, a big project to undertake. Um, and the thing is, when we said that, we had no technically feasible way of doing that. Um, we had a catalog, but that doesn't allow us to export millions upon millions of records in digital assets um, and somehow upload them um, you know, to another site. So, um, <clears throat> again, around the same time, uh, this is the, our open government plan from 2016. Um, this is another important statement. Uh, in the past, NARA staff created funding <laughs> uh, that contained valuable information, but were locked in a static printed or electronic uh, locked in static printed or electronic documents like PDFs. NARA is working to develop a solution for next generation finding aids that are dynamically updated as information changes. Um, I'm going to assume most of you know what a finding aid is. Uh, it's very different from a uh, normal catalog record. Uh, it's, you know, has uh, other types of, like, especially narrative sections, uh, scope and content, uh, history notes. Um, inventories of all the unique records or folders or boxes from the archival collection. Um, so the way uh, discovery happens, um, especially in archives, where everything is unique and is not able to be cataloged at the item level, um, it doesn't happen just through keyword searches. Um, the problem, of course, is that there are no finding aids uh, at archives.gov because it's it's an online catalog of archival descriptions, like I showed you. Um, and there is no way to make them appear as finding aids. Um, but that's the way that a lot of users want them, or that they can be, uh, that we can provide reference to users. Uh, so how, how can we make finding aids appear for
for users if all we have are catalog records um, you know, in the format uh, that most libraries actually do. Um, and part of the issue here is uh, the metadata is in the catalog. Um, so we kind of need to use the catalog's data to generate finding aids, and that's why they were called next generation. Um, and the, the data, especially the National Archives, where there's so much to process, and a, like a, an individual record group is consists of millions of records, and so new descriptions and, and digitized things are coming in all the time, um, the data is a moving target. So that's one reason you can't just scan in the old PDF from 1995. Um, so again here, this goal was set before uh, a next generation finding it ever existed. Um, so we needed a way to do these things, basically. Um, and we have goals uh, when it comes to discovering access that are beyond just uh, what our on online camp catalog as a website can deliver to users. So <coughs> um, enter the API. Um, and I was involved in the, the API's um, design in the very beginning. Um, it was soft launched in 2014, um, around at the same time as our refreshed uh, catalog. Um, the National Archives API is a read-write API. Uh, RESTful principle follows RESTful principles. Um, it's an API. The, data, the underlying data set consists of all of the archival descriptions. Again, 100 million records in the API as well. Uh, all of the National Archives authorities, actually all of the, cr the crawled web pages of NARA web properties, um, all of the digital objects, all of our media files, um, and, and also user accounts. Um, I should clarify, I kind of alluded to this, but the in the National Archives catalog, you can submit a tag or a transcription or register an account. Um, and that's the reason the API is read-write, because uh, you can do those things via the API as well. Um, so the, the main function of the API, though, is perform, performing fielded search uh, or ID-based retrieval. Uh, it allows you to search on any field um, in the data set rather than just the, the ones that we may have selected um, for an, to build the advanced search page in an online catalog. Um, so again, um, this is the catalog. Uh, but when I think about the catalog now, um, what I'm really thinking about is this. Um, this is the, and please excuse, don't, don't think too hard about the data structure. Just <laughs> show, show you what our catalog looks like as data, because that's what it is. Um, so, uh, I will skip. Uh, I, wanted, I wanted to show that because um, the, uh, I wanted to talk about like how um, we took the idea of uh, the API and kind of uh, like what we've um, done with it and how it's changed uh, sort of our, our outlook and our idea of what uh, you know, the National Archives uh, work is. Um, and the, one, the way I want to do that is to talk uh, first about a couple of things that we've done. Um, if you ever struggled with demonstrating the value of data, uh, the need to like plan and devote resources to having good data, um, to especially to non-technical staff. Um, this was one of our main uh, struggles. And the idea I came up with was we built uh, a sandbox uh, repository, basically, on our GitHub account. Um, and uh, have been using it to build prototypes and demos. Um, and we've been doing all of our, because of this, we've been doing all of our developing uh, in the open. And uh, this is going to be the part where I try to do a live demo by clicking on links and play those. Um, so this doesn't look like much. Just like if you're not a technical person, the structured data scrolling through the screen didn't, doesn't mean much to you. Um, but the, but we're, we're also using uh, GitHub pages 
so the idea is we're throwing up some uh, actual like coded HTML pages, JavaScript and CSS or whatever, but use hosting on GitHub so that um, when we're in a meeting or if we want user feedback or whatever it is, and we have an idea of how we can use the API to do something cool, integrated with our web, um, we can actually show it to someone. Um, so here's just a couple of examples. Um, so we have an internal uh, use case of a uh, um, uh, particularly proud of this one. Uh, some of our uh, our community managers, uh, our staff that um, that work on the catalog in um, uh, working with the public with our citizen archivist initiative, getting people to tag and transcribe. Um, they they have times where they want to tag like a thousand or two thousand records at once um, <clears throat> because they're using them for tracking. Uh, they have like uh, like code tags. Um, so this is a, an example where we showed how using an API, uh, you can, I'm not gonna like totally uh, okay, I did my password. Uh, so very simple tool, it's not intended to, to ever go out to the public, um, but a staff person can use this, type in the identifiers of the things they wanna tag, uh, and click a button, and it'll tag, you know, a thousand things. Um, so that's one example of uh, an internal use case. Uh, an external use case. Uh, I'm actually going to skip down to the second one uh, or third one. The guide to federal records. If you're familiar with the National Archives at all, um, in the '90s the, was the last time that they published the Guide to Federal Records, which was an actual print volume, or I think multiple volumes, of essentially a finding aid to everything in the National Archives, organized by record groups, which is mainly like by the agency that they came from, um, and then within that, like uh, broken down topics and uh, histories of the uh, agencies and things like that. Uh, that kind of work doesn't really scale. Um, and so it hadn't been published or updated since like 1995. Um, <clears throat> this is an example of taking that same concept, uh, oh, but it had been basically transcribed and put on a, a web page. Uh, but it was still the same content from 1995. Um, this is an example of taking that, and I can put in, uh, I'm just going to say record group one. Uh, which is going to be a small one, but this data, um, and hopefully it finishes loading, uh, is uh, an example we can show of uh, what we might mean by next generation finding aid. This is all data that's coming live from the National Archives API. Um, so when a user says, I want record group one, then the JavaScript code on this page uh, you know, sends a query to the API uh, saying, give me this identifier, um, all the data, and displays that in the top section. It was actually two loads because then it says, also, uh, show me a search results page of all of the uh, children of this um, record group. And so these are the, that's, this is what, the way the Guide to Federal Records is structured is that it, it shows you all of the uh, series that are listed, that are um, within that, that record group. Um, but it's generating that dynamically. Um, and it's not hard coded like each record group. So if we add a new record group tomorrow, you know, if the federal government created a new agency during this administration, or, um, you know, it'll be there if you search for it as long as it's in the catalog data set. Um, you know, new series are described um, or things are changed. Um, the, uh, something new is digitized or described at the item level. Um, this is a living document. Um, so this is an example of like how we, uh, like the approach we are going to take, this is a, in beta now, but the approach that we, that we want to be able to take for um, achieving the idea of next generation finding is. Uh, 
Um, but you get a picture. The other example, FOIA search, is just um, I mean, the idea that uh, we have a lot of things that come into the National Archives and are digitized because of the Freedom of Information Act request. Um, and so they have their own like tracking identifiers. But you wouldn't be able to search on that basis in our catalog. But because the API allows field to search on any field, we can just you know build our own um, uh, our own site with some <coughs> JavaScript that searches that field and displays uh, records on that basis. Um, so uh, the other big thing I want to talk about is that. Um, right now, we're in the middle of a redesign of a version two of our National Archives catalog, uh, the like, current iteration of the catalog. Um, but the, the, the most important thing about this is uh, our catalog redesign right now is actually just an API redesign. Um, and we're at, the, we're at this point where actually the catalog is no longer the catalog, it's the catalog UI. So when I'm talking about the website, catalog.archive.gov. Um, internally at the National Archives, we tend to refer to that as the catalog UI. Um, the, the reason for that is we see the catalog as the data set uh, and not the website. The, uh, if, if we develop um, a, a usable, uh, great, robust API for that data set, then it allows people to have access to those the records, the metadata, um, in any form that they need to be able to consume it in. Um, and the most important kind of change there is that we call it the catalog UI because now we think about our online catalog as just being one of many consumers uh, of our API. Um, and so originally, that of course, the first catalog that didn't have a persistent URLs, didn't have like an open API underlying it. But even the, the, the current version, if you look, if you go to our catalog right now, is not based on this API that I've been talking about. Um, it has you know, its own uh, standalone design. Um, but the, the new goal is we're designing an API such that uh, the second phase of the catalog redesign will be actually just uh, redeveloping our UI <coughs> to take the data from our API, um, which it had not done before. Um, eat your own dog food if you're familiar with the technical uh, term. Um, so what this means is we've, uh, in really, even though the government moves slow and it hasn't seemed that amazingly fast to me being on the inside, um, in about five years, um, in the time that I've been at the National Archives, um, we've moved from, from that catalog with non-persistent URLs to now um, API-first development. Um, as long as our data is accessible, we can do all the things that we want to do. Um, and so we need to make it accessible uh, through an API as you know, flexibly as we can. Um, and so I kind of like to think of it as, uh, if you're familiar with the uh, concept of as a service, um, which like the thing exists out in the cloud, like Google Maps is maps as a service because you yes, can just use it as a map, but also it can be integrated with whatever uh, <coughs> site you're trying to build or whatever. So um, we're kind of thinking about it as, or I personally, I think of it as the National Archives as a service because um, you know the idea is that it should be able to be built into um, whatever application internally or externally um, that it is needed for. Uh, so it's not purpose built for a single use case. Um, I guess what I'm getting at is that um, the basically the core purpose of um, the archival profession is about providing access to records. Um, so all of the uh, all of the things that we do, like preservation, uh, reference, uh, description, um, are for that eventual purpose. Uh, yes, even preservation is for the purpose of access. Um, and so the 
the, the, the record itself is data because the, the, essentially the work product of the art profession is creating that, uh, that data. The record is the thing, the data is like the work product is the way I think about it. Um, so increasingly, you know, in the current information age, the way we're accessing <coughs> records, access, accessing archival, um, you know, holdings, is not the record itself, but the data. Um, so uh, we, that's why we need to be able to do this. Um, if you don't believe me that we're API first, uh, here's our current uh, strategic goals. This, was, uh, this is our new strategic plan in 2018. Um, <clears throat> Or these are a few of the goals that pulled out from it, I should say. Uh, by 2024, NARA will digitize 500 million pages of records. By 2025, NARA will provide digital next generation finding aids to 95% of the holdings. By 2025, NARA will have 1 million records enhanced by citizen contributions. By 2025, at least 15 external sources will be using NARA data sets. Um, so, uh, to me, that just demonstrates it. Um, I, and I'm, I guess I'm glad this is being recorded because, Melton, if you're listening, <laughs> that, that is why the, we can't send you a, a catalog in the mail, I'm sorry, um, but hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions? So how, how do like bulk downloads fit into your like, data plan? Do you like, make those available? Is that mostly just API-based services? Uh, I guess it, so it would depend on your uh, need. Um, in theory, you can um, paginate all the way to the end. If you had all the time in the world, you could go through all the millions of records, uh, query them yourself uh, in the live API. Um, there is um, a export function that the API allows. And if it's like, takes more than a minute to process, then you have to like register an account and uh, find the download link in your account page. Um, so theoretically, it's possible to do exports as well. Uh, I'm impressed that you're able to do um user tagging and storing that data in your catalog, or do you keep it separate? Uh, I mean, I can, I don't know, actually, we're probably, I won't take too much time, but yeah, if you, if any, any record that's been digitized, um, there's like a, a button that just says add contributions uh, when you're looking at that record in the catalog. Um, so you can add a, a tag, you can transcribe the record, you can add a comment as well, just thread uh, the comment sections. In the National Archives catalog. Um, and yeah, so if you query those in the API as well, um, those are basically just attached uh, in the metadata, just like um, when we upload a, a digital media file and there's the technical metadata and stuff. It's just all like nested in part of the, the records metadata as well. Did you have trouble getting it through your security office? Because the library of Congress, they would love to do it for a long time. Um, well, there are, yeah. I mean, it's not considered a, a like vulnerability because it's only external. There's no like confidential information. So, yeah, if, if we were trying to like let people log into a secure system, there would be issues. But for whatever reason, we haven't had that. And, uh, and it's clearly marked in the catalog as like not authoritative. Um, and it, in fact, we don't even moderate it. As at all, so it's kind of more like the the wiki data model you've been hearing a lot about, rather than like uh, some other um, examples of uh, like the Smithsonian transcription um, uh, project. I think they had a lot more uh, moderation because you can actually mark something as having been moderated, which we don't.
Um, just curious, uh, in the interface, uh, whether you're, you're able to reproduce the hierarchies that are in archival descriptions, does that actually display it, or do you kind of drill down each the various levels? Yes. Uh, uh, well, so, uh, yes, we do. I would say that's one of the main things that makes uh, our catalog and our data model for the API hard to use for the average user um, who doesn't, who you, like, if you assume that somebody doesn't have any knowledge of how archives work. Um, so, uh, it's something that we kind of struggle with because we've inherited these, like, kind of archival ways of doing things. Um, so it is true. I mean, it's a little different because, of course, uh, it's not a finding aid. So you're not going to have the context of like the parent records own metadata at hand. Um, but the catalog does display like if you're looking at an item, it says this is the parent series, the grandparent record group. That's all there. Um, we part of the the redesign I was talking about. Like, catalog redesign is really an API redesign, is really a data model redesign, um, because our data model is, uh, if you were looking closely at the data I was showing, you can have like, it's like 12 levels deep of nesting of uh, fields in some places, and if you're trying to like access uh, a certain field to search on it, uh, it's not easy, and so we're, we're trying to redesign it so that uh, the data model is not so archival, um, but like um, the idea is that you take the the data and then you can still present it. That way. As long as you know, like the level of description of this record is X and it has these children, you can show in your your application in our catalog UI. You can display how how you like so that it gets the right idea across, um, but without making the data model uh, terrible because of that. Thank you. The reception's on the second floor right below us, and you can go anytime you want. Thanks. <laughs>